Hi, my name is Dave White. It's really great for taking part in this cloud native virtual summit. I really hope you like the session and you're able to take a few things away from it. As this is a virtual uh, summit, I thought it was really important to try and make a do something different and make a human connection at the start of the session. So for the next 30 seconds, I want to tell you a bit about myself. I want to keep this video on. I promise you, as soon as this bit's done, it's turned off and it's going back to the rest of the presentation. So briefly, uh, I'm an ops lead at AutoTrader. I've been at AutoTrader for around 15 years uh, and been in various uh, operation roles, mainly roles focused around the uh, uptime, stability, and performance of our, our website. Um, I'm also one of the co-organizers of the DevOps meetups in Manchester. And that's it, short and sweet. So let's crack on with the rest of the presentation. I call this talk Under the Bonnet at AutoTrader. Just give some context, we're currently migrating all our applications to the public cloud with the aim of turning off our data centers by the end of the year. Along the way, we built out some, I believe, truly game-changing DevOps tooling, utilizing Kubernetes and Istio. AutoTrader is the UK's largest digital automotive marketplace. We are a 45-year-old company. We used to be a magazine company, or a magazine-only company. In 2013, we transitioned uh, from a pub publishing company to being 100% digital. Just so you are aware, we don't have any connection to AutoTrader in America or Canada. It's pretty much a UK-only business. This is my stats from January. So there's 58 million cross-platform visits, 259 million advert views, and 14 million devices with our app on them. And depending on all this, we have 800 employees. We've got a headquarters in Manchester, got an office in London and an office in Dublin, around 200 developers and 20 infrastructure and platform uh, squad members. That's a multi-discipline squad, a really important squad who looks after our centralised um, platform. This graph shows the rate of releases to our live environment. Our financial year is from April to April. We start off with manual deployments. This is two ops engineers, uh, a cab, and a very frustrating uh, release process to manage. We then moved on to auto deployments. This was more scripted deployments. Uh, again, a burden on ops and still quite frustrating to manage. Lastly, we've moved on to we're still in this era now as a continuous delivery. At this point, we built out our own private cloud platform. We had to make changes to make our apps cloud native before we moved them across to the platform. The bonus around this was Ops handed the release keys over to our devs. The cab process was dropped and product squads could release their apps whenever they wanted, which was really good. We moved our first app into the public cloud in December 2018. And now some apps are getting released to live multiple times a day, hence a massive jump in stats. One big benefit of this is fast feedback loops if issue is spotted and uh, fix the roll up really quickly. So talking about the platform, so I'm focused on our delivery platform. It's worth being aware that we also have a separate enterprise and a data platform, and they're also in the public cloud. To get some history on our journey, we currently have two data centers. Along the way, we've moved from just using physical servers, then moved on to VMware, and then we built out our own private cloud on CloudStack to try and improve our developer velocity. Whilst we were running on our private cloud, we didn't really appreciate, or what we didn't appreciate was the complexity and the operational overhead of managing this. We chose an open source product called CloudStack, and increasingly there was less community support. We had challenges when upgrading and issues managing dependencies. What brought us to the fore for us was that we tried to address a GDPR concern from a customer. They wanted end-to-end -end encryption, and we estimated it would take about six weeks for us to build out a solution for it. However, three months later, little progress had been made. So we spiked out a solution in public cloud and achieved results within a few days. This highlighted 
of the opportunity for us to go faster in the public cloud, staying true to our aim to increase developer velocity. In August 2018, we had an agreement to push forward with a public cloud migration. We migrated our first application in December. As part of migration, we agreed that it wouldn't just be a lift and shift exercise. We wanted to embrace all the benefits of the public cloud and build out our DevOps capabilities. We also committed to moving everything, so 100% cloud migration. We built out a centralized platform supported by our platform squad on the Google Kubernetes engine and are using Istio as a platform which helps us connect, manage, secure, and observe microservices. We want to showcase. Before I go on, it's worth uh, discussing a few caveats. So firstly is some of the tooling that we're showing has been developed in-house. Unfortunately, it's quite intertwined in our systems. We can't really open source it, uh, but should give some inspiration around what is possible. Secondly, every company is different. So what might work for us uh, works because we built it a certain way or it's a culture or process that we use that might be compatible with, with you and your company. So it's worth bearing that in mind. To set my scene. So I'm gonna take you through getting a basic app. I've created a basic app and uh, how do I um, check it in Docker, test it in Docker, and then how do I get that onto a platform? Also, once it is in a platform, what tools can I use from a developer point of view to make sure things look good? And then I'm gonna walk through our DevOps portal. So very much a portal that a developer or operations can use to get a lot of really good information. I'll then take you through fault injection. So quite a recent thing that we've we've created and um, started doing some chaos testing. Basically you can inject a fault and you can see the output from that. So I'll go through one of a test scenario. And lastly, uh, chaos cracking. So chaos cracking is a tool we have managed to open source and I'll go through that um, at the end. So let's make a start. So I'm going to take a base application I've created, which I've called Cloud Native, and this is in GitHub Enterprise. And I'm going to get do the well, I'm going to do ne what's necessary to get this onto our cloud platform. Other tools I'm using is VS Code. Here's the application of VS Code and command line. So first step is to really get files that I need to simplify this for developers because it can be quite hard to configure various YAML files and Docker files. Um, we built out an application we call Shipper CLI. Effectively you can download Shipper CLI, install it, and that gives you a tool set you can use to, to uh, talk to the platform. So let's do that. I'm going to type Shipper, this is tab complete, uh, project in it. But ask us a series of questions that we need to answer. Um, so first one is what language the app is going to be in, what is in, written, and that's in Ruby. The second name is what's name your project. So I'm going to keep it simple, keep that as a cloud native. Give a short description of your project. This will show in the app directory. I'm going to go through the app directory a little bit later. So basically I'm going to put cloud native showcase which squad owns this project so I'm part of the operations squad I'm going to put operations which email address you the primary contact for this project so we've got a concept of having an owner for the an application and we have that for uh, ownership around you build it you own it you get alerts for it you support it um, pretty much that's what we're doing so the I'm going to be the owner for this application. Next one is who is the OE squad buddy for this application? So OE, the OE is an operations engineer and uh, effectively we've only got a few operations engineers and uh, we split it up. So they're sort of the ops sort of contact for the product squad. So if a product squad's got an issue, uh, they'll contact the OE squad buddy to help them. Likewise, if, if we need to speak to a, a um, product squad about their application, if it's not performing, then normally 
would get the relevant OE squad buddy to go and speak to him about that. I'm going to pick the first one. So Dylan, what environments would you like to deploy to? So I'm only going to, I'm only going to deploy this to uh, pre-prod just to save uh, time. So I won't select prod. By default, we don't really select dev because dev is you doing your uh, test within Docker. So I'm going to keep that as just pre-prod. That's been created as a series of files. So it's created a Docker file, Docker compose, various Helm files, and the um, uh, readme from a template from a template that we got basically. And if I was to ls, I can see what's created these files. So going across to VS Code, I can see these new files here. So my first step is I want to before I, before I can put some on the platform, I want to test it locally within Docker. I've I know that I've got a few small changes to make to this Docker file. So this is a notepad that I've got with these changes, just very small adjustments. Just to add this command at the bottom, I'll save that. And I need to write this command within Docker Compose and save and come out of that. So I made two small tweaks to these Docker files. And you see though, format wise, it's pretty good to have a template in me not trying to create this myself. It has pre-populated a lot of information. So if I go back to command line and do docker compose up build. I'm building up. That's out built. Let's go through browser and check and make sure it's working. So localhost 4567. And here's the app. This is it map wise. Uh, I've copied this from the delivery platform docs, which you'll see later. Um, quite like the flashing unicorns, but this is the app working, so it works locally within, within Docker. So I'm going to cancel that and show that's cancelled. That's the Docker part. I'm just going to clear the screen. Let's make it simple to follow what I'm doing. So from the VS code, I'm going to look at the Helm files. So I've got the a pre prod and a values a YAML. Click on the values YAML, you can see here there's a lot of really great information. So at the bottom, I've got the network policies. So it might be that I want my app to talk into another app. Um, as is microservices, we pretty much put the um, network rules in within the values YAML files. So my app doesn't need to talk to, to another app and no other apps need to talk to my app. So I'm going to keep this simple as, as cloud native. This section, so you can see why now I was, ans I was answering these questions. Um, it was creating basically the service, the service discovery and this come into play a little bit later when I show you the um, application dashboard. Then we've got the resources. So templated resources, if I want to, I could change these. For this app, it's not going to be touching the sides. Then we've got the readiness probe. So I've got to make one slight adjustment because it's a basic app. I haven't got health check endpoint. And we'll change this to four, five, six, seven. And I'm going to change slightly up here, the H2 port to be four, five, six, seven. And all of the details I'm going to leave alone. So I'm going to save that. So only a couple of changes for all these files. But what I do need to do is get this into my git repo. So I'm just going to do git add and git commit. I'm just going to put ready for cloud. And git push. If I go to my repo, you can see all the new files in there, including the readme. I'm not going to change any of this readme, but um, we quite like the template, which you can adjust if you want. So next thing, I need to be getting this pushed into GoCD um, and then push it onto the platform. So to do that, I'll go back to using my trusty shipper and clear the screen. I'll do shipper. 
project pipeline create. So what do I want pipeline to be called? I'm happy with shipper CLI dot cloud native. What group should pipeline be created in? So I've got various groups within Go CD. I'm part of the operations engineering. What's the URL? Is the URL for your apps Git repo? It's already pre-populated, which looks good. And what environment would you like to deploy to? So I'm only going to select, as previously stated, to the pre-prod. So keep it at that. Please enter your GoCD username. So it's first name last and password. It's always good when that works without any issues. So pipeline successfully created, please review its configuration. I'm just gonna click through to that. And this is the uh, pipeline. So to start this off and push it out, I'm just gonna trigger it. So I'm gonna do shipper pipeline trigger. What's the name of the project? Username and password. Oh, it's triggered. So, first stage is to publish. The second stage is to push it to the environment. I'm just going to follow what it's doing. So, I picked up an agent. Take a few seconds to go through this. Uh, so, checking for dependencies and it's building the application. First stage done. Just refresh. So now it's getting pushed out to pre-prod. It's when you pick up an agent, so it's picked up an agent. And it's starting to build. So validating project for pre-prod. It's going to go through a series of validation checks. Uh, if it fails any of these checks, then it's going to error. So it's gone through those checks. Uh, check out network policies, making sure the YAML validation and other aspects. So it's past that. Next stage then um, is it's doing all that's needed behind the scenes to uh, be creating the various policies, various networking, uh, various Istio configs, etc. It just takes a little while for it to churn through that. Um, I'm not, but it's worth noting that I've not pushed this app through for, so this is creating it all from scratch. Um, I've not pre-done this app. I'll give it a few seconds to go through and configure what is needed. And that's now work completed. So just to see, again, the Go agent check and dependencies, validation check, and uh, adding all the relevant components and all the relevant policies. That's passed, that's good. So if I go back to command line, I can go back to shipper again. So I've deployed, I want to get the status of that deployment. So if I do shipper project status environment prepod prod. That's going to go away and uh, talk to your platform and bring back various information. So that's brought back again the the service discovery stuff, so some information I've put in, the relevant URLs, uh, importantly the URL for the application itself, and then metrics. So if I click on this app one, this is the app up and working. So that's good. I'm glad that worked. I can come away from that. Uh, what about some other stuff? So I could go to logs. 
I can go to the tracing. There's not going to be much tracing there. Just a few items. You'll probably find that's the um, the just redness probe checking. But basically, some traces in place. So uh, I can also check the logs. So if I just do shipper logs e prod, this is going to go away and get the logs from the the pods. As you can see there, my uh, me testing, but also this is the readiness probe that's that's checking the URL. So the main point trying to get across here is as a, a developer utilizing Shipper CLI, I can connect to a platform without need of going to the pods directly, without need of really understanding or installing anything different um, around Kubernetes. This is just the interface into platform, dragging out really essential information and links all in one place. Um, that's it. So next, I'm going to walk through our platform dashboard. Just before I do that, just sort of be good to summarize um, where we're up to. So just taking you through and showing you how easy it is to get a simple application uh, onto the new platform. That's utilizing Shipper CLI to download the relevant templates, also using it to create the pipeline within our um, CI CD tool, and um, how to trigger the pipeline and to get it pushed out onto the platform. But also showing you how we can use Shipper CLI to interact with the platform and drag back some essential information with checking the status. And within that, there was various links that a developer can use uh, easily and quickly to be checking the status of their app. Now, we don't really expect everyone to be downloading all the repos and utilizing or interrogating a platform that way. We needed some other easy way of doing that. This is where the platform dashboard was born. So I class this as essentially AutoTrader's DevOps portal. Any developer, any operation person, pretty much anyone really, with the uh, access given can access this, this portal and there's a wealth of information. To start off with, uh, this is the main view. This is the home page of the dashboard. Uh, it's done by cluster. So if I click on here, you can see the environments. It's got dev, pre-prod, prod, and BCP. And all the, all the uh, dashboards for each cluster is pretty much laid out the same. I can tell I'm in prod currently by the top right hand corner. This is summaries. Um, this is dragging information from Istio, it's dragging information from Kubernetes and also from Prometheus. Uh, I can see how many applications that I've got in live. So 335 there in total, one new this week. Um, how many deployments were carried out the last 24 hours. If I click through that, this takes us to uh, Lighthouse. Effectively, Lighthouse is showing us um, well, when you roll out an application, you're going through a pipeline and the pipeline sends a signal to Lighthouse and Lighthouse records what's being released, uh, how long it's taken. So just for example here, this little auction elastic consumer release started at 11.56 and it took one minute and five seconds to deploy the last part of the deployment. So this is a very place we, place we can go to visually see um, what's released when, when we're releasing a lot of um, information. Or releasing, I'm sorry, doing a lot of releases. This is another in house uh, developed tool. Come back to a dashboard. I can see uh, the distribution of, of applications by squad. I can see the spend by squad. So from that, I can see how much the applications actually cost in, uh, cost in the company. Uh, a whole lot of details are down here by the amount of containers, the amount of uh, resource, so CPU, memory, and the language uh, distribution. So we're pretty much a Java house, very clear from this graph that we are. So that's pretty much the, the dashboard. On left here you can see there's more um, areas to dig into. So next area I'm going to take a look at is the app directory. So in a nutshell, the application directory is a directory of applications that are on our delivery platform. I'm going to drill into this now to find an app and go through um, this in a bit more detail. So if I look for API Gateway, there's two applications, I'm going to focus on this one here. So just go through in slow time, the name of the app is API Gateway. 
is looked after by the stock and search platform. So that's a product squad who is responsible for this application. The owner is Chris Kelly. It's very important to have a, an owner and clear ownership of an application. Uh, if Chris, say, left the company tomorrow, there's a background check that checks for AD and notes that his email address won't exist when he's removed and we'll get an alert telling us that uh, this app has no longer an owner. So then we'll have to make sure that we get a, a new owner for the application. This is a tier two app. So we've got three tiers, um, tier one, tier two, tier three. Uh, tier two means that basically there's uh, all the normal monitoring in place and any uh, big system impacting issues get an email uh, alert, get sent to the on-call engineer. A tier one, difference between tier one and tier two is that around, it's around BCP. Effectively, um, our environment is split into three zones. If all of those are, are wiped out, we can fail over to a, another region. It's basically a region failover. For this application, we don't believe we need that. So this is a tier two app. The buddy, so buddy is an, we call an OE buddy. It's an operations engineer buddy. Effectively, Dylan, um, who's an operations person, sits within the infrastructure and platform squad and makes sure he, he keeps in touch with the stock and search platform. So basically keeps that connection with them. He might go to the standups. Um, they might have him as a first port of contact if they want to speak to anyone operations about anything. And down here, we've got a description. So this is a description of this application. On the right side, you can see by this tag that it uses a, a DB, which is MySQL database, and the app's written in Java. There's also a drop down here. Just drop down, you've got the various URLs for the application, um, which is really handy. And you've got direct links to the pipeline, direct links to the value stream metric, and the uh, source code in Git, and tracing and log. So if I clicked on here, it'll take me through to a tracing. It just takes a couple of seconds to load. This would be for all tracing for the application. So when I want to be investigating uh, any issues, uh, I can select one of these and I've got a whole lot of detail about how it's going through and its interaction within the platform. I can also click through to logs. So we use Kibana. Um, logs are put onto Elastic. So if in one click, I can go through and uh, see the logs. We don't restrict access to the logs for anyone. Any anyone that wants to see the logs has got access. And working way down, we got various metrics. So service mesh metrics, which I'll go into a bit more detail. Effective issues utilizing a lot of the Istio data. Then we have metrics for JVM. So we clearly look into any issues around uh, Java memory. And the last one I got is metrics around the, the database. So in database issues, I can dig in, try to, to have visibility of this. So that's here. If I want to, I can click through. So if I click through to the application itself, there is a warning that there's an, an error that I'm sure being being investigated. Again, description. Uh, contacts, a bit more detail about the tier two. And right side, we've got a dependency graph. So this pretty much shows any applications that have got a clear dependency with this API gateway. We've got a link, so effectively this is all the links that you've seen before um, at a more top level. And the important area is uh, here is network rules. So because you can stipulate the network rules within the uh, the Helm files, then this drags this out, you can see this visually. So I've got the inbound network rules and the outbound network rules. This one is quite good to see. Effectively what's happening here is this app is configured to the well, it's got an outbound rule allowing it to talk to search one. But if I click on search one and go to the application, I'm pretty sure you're gonna see that there's no inbound rule for for this API gateway on that app. So 
if you're trying to investigate an issue where it might be around network rules, it's quite good that we get a warning here so we can dig into it quite quickly. It's quite visual. It enables you to dig into the issue or identify the issue quite quickly. I can also leave a note here. So it might be um, ignore alerts, miss tests for now, or on this application. So ignore. Just an example. I can leave a note. If it's no longer relevant, I can delete that note, which is quite handy. That's effectively the application directory. Next, we'll move on to the dependency graph. So I really love this graph. I think it's, it's quite cool. It's quite uh, a good way of visualizing the, the environment. I think before digging into this, it's probably worth us explaining how we used to do things. So I've got an old photo here. Uh, and this is the way we used to do the dependency graph. So pretty much any wall we've got at Trader, you can, can write on. So if you've got a, something to show or something to go through, you can write on the walls, which is quite good because it enables us to then draw out the network, well, draw out the application connection dependency diagrams within the wall. So you can see here there's various names and various lines uh, connecting all the apps. Clearly, this is, uh, whilst it's okay, it's quite good to visualize. Obviously, um, as soon as an application is either decommissioned or a new app comes along, you've got to try to fit it in, and it's always a nightmare trying to keep this updated. Essentially, the last time you draw on it, as soon as the pen comes away, it's already outdated. But it worked for us, and that's where we used to do the dependency graph. Moving into this, it's just it's just a completely different, completely different way of looking at things main thing here as well is that this is a live, this, this can't go out of date, but the application is live on the platform, then this is the connections of that. And you can drill in. So I want to see what's connecting to Kafka. Click on Kafka, I can see all the connection points. Uh, so that's the dependency graph. Next move on to the service mesh. So this link takes you through to the our main service mesh dashboard. This essentially, I think, most important dashboard that we've got and gives you an overall health of our platform, taking on board the data captured from, from Istio. There's quite a lot of information going here, but we'll go through explaining or I'll break down some of it down. So it's currently seeing prod. I can see it's prod because by the URL. Um, we've got prod, I can change that to dev or pre-prod. Various data around cost, around the uh, data rate in, out, cess rate, etc. Then you've got the uh, total request volume by response code. So that's good because mostly 200s, but I can drill down and see that we have got some 500s. Take that off. And these blue lines indicate deployments. So if I highlight over that, I can see various deployments. It's really important because if I've got a blue line here and afterwards we start to see some issues, then we can relate that to deployment. On the right, I've got the top 10 applications by request volume. You start to pick up on the patterns of volume. Uh, if you see some increase and decreases, it could indicate that there's an issue. The most important boxes are down here. So, uh, we've decided for now that we believe the 500 errors are really ones that we want to um, <coughs> to visualize and be aware if there's actually any issues. So this is capturing any 500 and 501 errors. You can see here that there is some errors, but quite low level, and you've got a breakdown of the actual applications are erroring. Again, the blue lines deployment are across all these these graphs. So uh, if there was say a blue line deployment, say if this Sauron search service, Sauron service search, and this was Sauron service search, it could indicate that there's an issue around the release. Um, but there's a good way to visualize and clear, clearly see if anything breaks. So if the release goes in and all of a sudden we get a massive amount of errors, then I can quickly identify its um, probably related to, to that release. I'm going to break it down for 
gateway, er gateway errors and timeout, so 504s, etc. Um, so this is a, a dashboard that's on various monitors and it's just glanced at that during the day. So you do pick up an incident so really quickly. So I can pick up an issue by visualizing it and start investigating it well before some of our traditional monitoring or well, well before any customers um, phone in about, about an issue. So very important dashboard. So another really important set of uh, service mesh dashboards is the service health dashboard. Each namespace or each application has got its own uh, service health dashboard. This one here, as an example, is for search one read. As well as a number of stats at the top, you can see the list of uh, applications that, that can talk into search one read. And I can see that search one read talks out to search solar. So quite a lot of apps talking to it, and it's only talking to one. Scrolling down, there's a wealth of information. So data around response codes, uh, response times, uh, destination response codes, response times, which is really important in trying to investigate, identify where the root cause of an issue is. Scrolling down further, I've got some golden signals. So I can see the performance of all the apps that are talking into this app. Um, and lots of more information. This one's really good. So we got the CPU and RAM data, uh, network and disk data, but we need to keep an eye on the CPU and RAM. So if we see any issues, we can we can up that for um, for the application. So a wealth of information there. So next thing I want to show is Skipper. So Skipper is uh, one of our alerting frameworks. Uh, what does it is takes alerts from Prometheus. Uh, into Skipper, makes them a bit better, and then pushes these out into Slack. And via various configs, we can push the alerts into various Slack channels. So the main channel alerts are going to is this K8 Alerts Pro channel. So this is in Slack. Uh, I've just hidden the stuff on the left. I don't really want to show names or other channels, but this is important information here. And there's various alerts. So. Uh, focus on some of these. So the top one here, we I briefly mentioned that uh, this checks done against service owners. So here for advertising and branding, the service owner is invalid when we get alert and the information RAM alert is here. It's basically saying the owner cannot be located in the Active Directory user or groups. So Dylan has took this alert and he's going to be speaking to a squad and, and getting a new squad owner. Uh, just scrolling down, some more alerts here, so platform dashboard, application instance restarted. So we can see here that uh, it's fired on uh, these containers and Carl's took an issue with this. Scrolling a bit further, platform dashboard, service returning high amount of uh, 500 codes. So it kind of explains what the alert is. Um, you've got the, um, the pod that's firing that alert. Um, but I want to highlight this, so Carl's took ownership and there's two replies here. So scroll down on here. So Skipper recognizes there's been a deployment. So similar times when an issue occurs, it's due to a deployment. It's quite good to have the information straight away. I've shown two or three different places where we can see the deployment has recently occurred, but it's quite good to actually get it with the alert. So I've got alert. I can see that within the last 30 minutes, uh, Skipper tell me deployment has gone through and links through to uh, Git and Go CD uh, to get more information. And then uh, secondly, this is more common, uh, we get this information if there is an alert, the Jager, uh, there's eight errors in Jager. So I can click on this link and go through to Jager and try and trace through where the issue is. So that's skipper alerting. Okay, so fault injection. If you're running a lot of microservices, uh, at some point an, the, an application will have issues. It's really crucial to understand what impact that has on connected applications. Uh, so that would be by trying to test with either in, increasing the latency or increasing the 500s or, or stuff like that. So we've done it, we've built out full injection and uh, we can test this. So I'm going to use the 
our platform dashboard to show you the how we would do that. So we connect to the platform dashboard and I'm on the app for search one read. If I scroll down a bit, you can see the fault injection section. So I can in inject latency a percentage of the time, I can inject status codes, uh, and then as simple as applying the fault. So if I do this now, so pretend inject some latency a percentage of the time and click apply faults, I'll show you what to configure fault injection. Yes, I do. That's been configured. Good glow around here, that's an indication that a fault injection uh, is on. Uh, to stop that, it's as simple as resetting default. That's gone. So I'll just show you uh, what it looks like. So going on a search mesh, this is for Sauron Web. And Sauron Web connects to Search One Read. This is the app I did the fault injection on. I scroll down. So uh, I have already done some tests. I've done two tests. One injected uh, latency. So increased response time. And you can see the increased response time on the app connecting to the app that did a fault injection. But the important bit is the impact from that. So I can see at the same time uh, as that, the 200 dropped, dropped off, meaning that uh, this app doesn't like the latency on the app it's trying to connect to. That's one thing we've done, I've done. Also, uh, did a test increasing of 500. So increase of 500, uh, and I can see the increase in 500 here but no drop off in overall uh, traffic. So it's more it's as more tolerant of uh, a percentage of 500 uh, within the app it's connecting to. Previously, it might have been this app might have completely killed over if it hit a few 500s. So that's fault injection, very clear and easy way of injecting and a very clear, easy way of seeing the impact from that. As a company, we started um, introducing uh, Chaos Fridays, so spending about an hour doing these fault injection tests, analyzing the impact, making relevant changes to ensure the impact's minimized and then and the testing again to confirm uh, it works pretty well. So finally, just want to brief talk about Chaos Kraken. Chaos Kraken is an application that we've recently open sourced. Uh, what it is, and it says it here, it's based on an application to simulate JVM based uh, various scenarios when running on a delivery platform. This app actually uh, created a number of years ago. It's back in 2017 it was built whilst we still had a private cloud and we utilized or needed some app to test various scenarios so our operations people, staff, could learn uh, a bit how, on how to uh, how to react against those or how to fix the issues they were, they were coming across. But it was a really good tool back then to get us into more thinking cloud native. Uh, this is in github.com. Anyone can access this, feel free to have a play. Uh, if you contribute it, that, that would be awesome. And that's it. So I've been through quite a lot. Uh, hopefully they'll take a few things away from it. Basically, I'm just trying to show what a company our size, so around 350, microservices, how we operate, utilizing Kubernetes and Istio, uh, and hopefully take some inspiration from that. So lastly, uh, I've really enjoyed taking part at this first conference, uh, hopefully enjoy all the other presentations that are on, and I'll speak to you in the future. Cheers.